For acute number 30, I recommend the bow stroke that has a lot of flexibility in the wrist and the fingers of the bow hand and also that uh, we use the lower half of the bow to function within that one third, I would say, of the bow throughout the whole etude. We need a sound which has a good core to it, so I recommend that we have a very um, heavy and sustained uh, arm weight throughout and also economize the bow throughout so we have a core that comes from the weight and from the uh, clarity that is brought by the small usage of the bow. <laughs> couple of more issues to bring up in the first eight bars, specifically bar number three, we have a shift that uh, we need to decide how we are going to approach for safety. I suggest an uh, anticipated type of shift. Practicing slowly, you will see that I go early, I go light with the first finger, I hear my first finger note the B-flat, uh, in the previous bow and I played for real in the next bow. Then the next issue in bar 4 is the 4th finger that can be played with more comfort if we bring the elbow forward. Going on, starting bar number 5, we have many string crossings. I suggest that we have the elbow of the right arm slightly higher over the A string and then go back and forth with the fingers for the most legato and the most ease of execution. From number 9 to number 16 we are going to have a similar type of uh, passage that eventually will bring the fourth finger again to um, the thumb position high up and we need to plan ahead and bring the elbow level to the most comfortable angle. The next new material is introduced in bar number 33 and um, we have right away in the first few bars situations that are very much a trademark of Popper. We have a left hand that needs to be very flexible because he contracts and expands all the time within an area or position. Next bar, 43. Uh, starts a series of uh, string crossings and um, hiccupy type of bow. So in order to avoid uh, hiccups, we need to make sure that the third note is always long enough. A small but yet important thing, bar number 48, the first four notes we have uh, three half steps in a chromatic structure. We need to make sure that we have lots of space here for intonation. So by the time we reach the fourth finger, we are still in tune. Going on, we have a bunch of different kind of shifts to discuss, starting with bar number 51. For example, bar number 51, I do this particular fingering. Uh, and in this case, uh, with my fingering, I need to go to an F quietly so I can reach the D-flat safely. The next bar, 53, has a different kind of shift. When I go directly to the E-flat, all I have to be concerned is that I sustain the sound. And then going on, we have yet more shifts. We have to decide always what is the mechanical solution to a problem. In bar number 56, for example, we have a shift that would benefit if we were to use the anticipated approach to find the C-flat safely. We hit it early in the previous bow. Once we hit it for uh, softly, we are going to change the bow and play it for real in the next bow. 
uh, bar number 59 has a different kind of shift. For example, where we go directly to the note, to the A flat, while we sustain the bow. It's a very romantic type of slide. We should always know it and, and know how mechanically to, to get it. Um, going on, we have in bar 67, 69, 71, similar shifts where we need to go to the top note directly while we make sure to sustain and not chicken out the bow pressure. And finally, near the end of the etude, we have yet a few more shifts and we will play and discuss uh, how we approach them, starting with bar number 93. Bar number 95 has the first shift. I suggest that we do an articulated shift where we go to the D flat with the second finger softly and then we articulate the third finger. Afterwards, we have several shifts going backwards. I suggest we do them all anticipated. <laughs> 